keeping us um, kind of on schedule. So what I'd like to do is just move quickly through um, what I was hoping to share so that we can get to a conversation in the room. Um, so uh, just briefly about me, I'm a biochemist by training. I am um, a total science nerd like a lot of us and got into this space largely because of an interest of working with young people and a recognition as an adult that much of my access to STEM as a black woman um, with natural hair, who's big and chubby and all of these things that, again, we don't see necessarily, um, certainly when I was growing up as, as a model for science, was um, facilitated by my economic and social class, right? And so when I went to graduate school in Chicago at the University of Chicago on the South Side, it became incredibly clear to me almost immediately that I had had a very specific kind of experience growing up as a black girl where I did, and that was quite different from that of the students I was seeing walking down the street um, in my neighborhood. And so that really ignited a passion in me um, for working with young people. And so what I'll talk briefly about today are just a couple of examples of, of work that I've done with my teams at both the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago and where I am now at Northwestern University. Um, but what I wanted to start out with was um, my wokeness origin story as it relates to intersectionality. So I, I have some friends and colleagues who joke about wokeness origins. We have people who are super woke about all things. Oh, that's my Slack popping up, um, who are really conscious about certain issues and seem to forget that there was a time when they weren't. And the conversations they have you know, speak to this you know, just amazing knowledge and, and foresight that they must have had since birth. And, and I reject that pretty wholeheartedly and think that sometimes we do our communities a disservice by not talking about the time that we learned something that changed our perspective. Um, if you asked me 15 years ago if sex and gender were the same thing, I would say yes. And I was a scientist then too, right? Like, I'm okay saying that out loud. There was a time when I didn't know what I know um, and understand to be true now. So as it relates to intersectionality, I'd like to share my wokeness origin story. And it was in a program at the Museum of Science and Industry that was called Black Creativity. It was a really exciting program. It was an opportunity to present narratives of African-American innovators in STEM and arts. Um, and our task was to facilitate hands-on making programming, um, to present youth voice in museum space. So it was one of the first times in my experience there where young people actually produced work that went on display in the museum. For those of you who don't know the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, it's one of the largest science centers in the world, about a million and a half visitors every year. It sits right on the south side of Chicago in this beautiful building. I should have skipped past it. Um, it's the last remaining building from the World's Fair in 1893 and um, is a relatively inaccessible place to a lot of people. So the program that we launched was the Innovation Studio. It was not particularly fancy. It was a maker space with stools and tables and chairs. And kids got to do all kinds of hands-on making to create prototypes of solutions to challenges that they had identified themselves. So some students thought that they needed a heated umbrella because when it rains, sometimes it's cold. And how cool would it be to have heating wires underneath to keep you warm? Um, one student created a button that would alert her teacher that she was being bullied, but it wouldn't let any of the other kids know. She could just silently tell the teacher what was going on and get some help. And one of the things that we did in this space, in part because it was a really unique uh, program at the museum, was we often had media come in and interview our staff, interview our guests. And on one particular day in the studio, we had a group of students from a local charter school and they were in the space, and we don't select the students who get interviewed, right? The, the journalists go around, and they decide what looks interesting or who catches their eye. And later, the clip airs, and the museum gets, um, gets some press, and it's really nice for the entire experience. And I happened to have run into one of the teacher leaders from that group a couple of weeks after um, at, at a coffee shop, I believe. And she said, I wanted to tell you, I've been meaning to, co to contact you, that the young woman who got interviewed on television got to have her name on the TV screen. And she was making at the Museum of Science and Industry and putting out a product that was going to be on display there. And she had just transitioned, and that was the first time she used her new name in public. I was like, what? <laughs> I'm in the coffee shop crying because I'm a mess. Like, what a transformational experience. I'm making some assumptions. But how beautiful that must have been for her to share with her teacher that she was able to be featured on local news, like real news, um, with her new name in a way that made her feel proud. For my team, it was a moment of humility that we actually could have been a small part of an experience that, that led to that journey for that young woman. And it was a moment of immediate reflection. Because even though I've lived my entire life as a black woman, 
even though I created a space for making and learning around black experiences, my entire family and most of my friends are black, it had never occurred to me what might a young black trans person be experiencing in our space. And in a maker space, which can often be highly gendered in how we talk about the work and how we distribute the work and how we coach and facilitate the learning, that we had really missed an opportunity to be, to be thoughtful about students who had multiple or intersectional identities. So that was my wokeness origin story as it related to certain things. And it really led our, us as a team to think more deeply about the different types of identities, if you will, that our learners were coming into our museum space with. This is a graphic that has been adapted from some work at the University of San Diego, and it's a really nice, quick look at the, to helping to recognize that people come into learning spaces, they come into the grocery store, they come into their homes with all of the identities they, that they have, and that they all might actually play higher or lower roles in a particular experience depending on the context, depending on the history, depending on what's happening. And as a team, we hadn't been thinking about that at all. Right, is when we looked at research and education, we know what black students do. Sometimes we know what minority students do, big category. Or we know what young girls do or what boys do. But we hadn't really talked about or understood the intersectional experiences and how that impacted the work that we were doing. I love this quote from Audre Lorde. Um, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. Right? So at the core, none of us is showing up in any space with a single issue or a single identity. And so as science education programmers, especially for young people, it causes us to think about how could we do different work um, to, to achieve the outcomes we were hoping to achieve. So I want to move relatively quickly and just talk about a couple of programs where that allowed us to start thinking about this. And I think the theme in our panel has, has been about storytelling and narrative and voice. And right, the, the rejection of the monolith, if you will, requires individual voices being heard, right? individual identities um, and intersectional identities being present and in the forefront and recognized and valued. So a lot of our work at the museum, as well as at Northwestern, is about connecting young people with science professionals. And a lot of time that work is about, well, let's have a professional, and they'll go into a room, and they'll talk about science, and some magic will happen, and maybe there's a demonstration. And I'm not going to say how I feel about that particular model. I think it's fine. Um, but one of the things we really wanted to focus on was that, as we've heard today, I think, and, and others would agree with, that science doesn't happen without people. And actually, it's kind of all about people. So why don't we make it people first? When we're working with young people in middle grades who we know are constructing their identities, right? They're learning about themselves that's highly influenced by their social experiences and with whom they connect. They're thinking about what careers they may want to have. That leading with a person, leading with the multiple identities, is a powerful way for them to get connected to the multiple pathways into STEM. And so we took an approach for our STEM engagement and, and exposure programming to be exactly that, people first. We asked scientists to not come in with stuff and data and research, but actually come in with your personal story. What did you do as a kid? What got you excited about science? Where were you really out of place and felt like you didn't belong? Where was it easier or harder to navigate a particular pathway? And then like, you could talk about some science and what that means for the world, right? That transformed our way of thinking about both the value of STEM professionals in our learning environment and what the connection could be between, uh, between learners and researchers. And I'll acknowledge that one of the things that make, can make that really challenging is that as trained scientists, that's not always the practice or the skill set that we are developing, right? We're deep in our research. Maybe we do some teaching on the side, but telling a personal story about yourself in front of little kids you've never met before when you really just want to show the data that you got last week is not necessarily something that people have a lot of experience with. So the next point I want to make is that doing this work really well requires some training, right? And as we know, many people who are here at the symposium um, are doing a lot of great work in training STEM professionals and trainees in how to communicate effectively, and in particular, how to tell the story of themselves. One thing that we launched just before I left the museum was a two-year program for all graduate students in a particular program at the University of Chicago. And they came to the museum for four, time, four times a year for in-depth improv training and hands-on experiences. We helped them tell their stories. But then we actually coached them to doing experiences with the museum. Right? So there's the training piece, but then there's the, OK, but how do I do that? And so our team was able to work with them and coach them and provide feedback so that they were interacting with young people and telling those stories. And at the same time, they were meeting young people whose identities they had not experienced before. 
immigrant children, children from different neighborhoods in the city, those who were learning English uh, as a second language or a third language or a fourth language. And so building an understanding within the scientists of their own identities and the importance of that in their story has helped them understand the importance of that in the learners with whom they're connecting. The last piece I'll mention is that um, similarly at my current institution, uh, we have a program called Science Club that is a long-term after-school mentoring program designed to again connect graduate students with young people in neighborhoods around Chicago and Evanston. And our model is one of deep and extended engagement. So there's one mentor for every two students. So in our programs, we have about 70 mentors, 140 students. They meet weekly for the entire academic year for an hour and a half after school each week. So it's a pretty big commitment for graduate students. They go to a boys and girls club or a YMCA after school. Our community partners are um, shown down there on the bottom. And over the course of a year, they are getting roughly 60 hours of graduate training, graduate level training and coaching from our staff. So they're learning about um, diverse populations. They're learning about communicating with young people. They're learning about translating their science content, and they're learning how to tell their own stories. And then they're becoming mentors to these middle grade students for an entire year. And what we're seeing is that students are staying with us, the young children students are staying with us for up to about two, two to two and a half years over time. So from sixth to eighth grade, they're with us for about two years. Grad students are as well. So those of you who have been in grad school and remember, all the free time you had. They are deeply, deeply committed. They are excited to leave lab early. They're showing up and bringing cool stuff to show them. They're talking to their students about what's happening in their homes. And the students are similarly coming and talking about the grades they had at school, the boyfriend that they just broke up with, but it's seventh grade, so it's like super petty stuff. And they're inviting the mentors to their graduations. Right? And they're recognizing these are Northwestern graduate students, so you can imagine what that population looks like. It's a relatively traditional private university population with students from challenged neighborhoods in Chicago. And the relationships are working because they started with the person. That the scientist showed up as a person, the child showed up as a person, and the connection was made um, at that level first. And so what I want to end with is um, a couple of things that we have found, but more importantly, things that we continue to wrestle with and are learning from our colleagues in the, in the field. The first is that pathways into STEM are fundamentally individual, complex human stories, period. So we want to tell those first, especially when we're talking to young people for whom science might be this nebulous, scary, unfamiliar thing. Tell the people's story first. The second is that we're really understanding that youth programming needs to be created with intersectional identities in mind. So how do we go beyond, well, we know what works from that research study for women um, aged 5 to 12 in Cleveland. How do we go from that to understanding how to take into account the intersectional identities that everyone brings to a learning experience, which would include things like staff development, inclusion of voices at all stages of programming, and rejection of that monolith. And the last thing that we're focusing on and wrestling with is um, STEM trainees and professionals need training and supported practice, right? We recognize that it's not sufficient to just go to a training and say, good luck with that engagement work you're doing, but rather, how can we build a culture and a community of supported practice to help researchers themselves acknowledge the dominant STEM norms that they perhaps have benefited, benefited from, excuse me, and are certainly participating in and the intersectional experiences that may be quite oppressive for their learners. So I will end there.